and out came this calf. I love this story. You know, it ranks right up there with the dog ate my homework. <laughs> now, usually when we hear this story, there's all this focus on the revelry that's happening down below. While Moses is up on the mountaintop filled with fire and smoke and cloud and seeing God's hand etch out the Ten Commandments on the, on the tablets and all of that. But the real action's happening down below. We're once again, and who can blame them? Once again, the Israelites are scared. And when they get scared, they act just like you and me. Or maybe just like me. I shouldn't project it onto the congregation. That's the first rule of ministry school. They get scared. And when they get scared, they do things that they wouldn't do if they weren't scared like murmur against Moses when they're thirsty in the wilderness, complain against God when they're hungry in the wilderness. And this time, this time, God's not even in the picture. Did you hear it? Moses has left them. He's up on the mountain, supposedly talking to God. But these Israelites, up until now, the only God they've really known in the flesh has been Pharaoh. Pharaoh God. And what's happening in the wilderness is figuring out how do you relate to this God that doesn't look like Pharaoh? How do you relate to this God that is amorphous in terms of the eternal spirit of the universe? Is that God really going to be there to protect you when your whole life has been shaped by living among people who are bowing down to Pharaoh and bowing down to this golden idol and that golden idol and that silver person, or whatever. No wonder they're scared. Scared out of their minds, and then they do something that we sometimes do when we get scared. They, want, they murmur against Moses, but he's up on the mountain and is not going to hear him, so they go to Aaron, the second in command, and they're that close to becoming a mob. It doesn't take that much. And Aaron, how does he respond? He gets scared too. Okay, i got to come up with a plan. I, you know, i got all these people and the, I don't have Moses' magic touch to hit a rock with my staff and bring forth water or you know, say there's going to be manna in the wilderness or part the, re- the sea or all those things. <gasps> got an idea. Got an idea. I'll get them to get all of their jewelry throw it into a big fire, and then I'll make a golden calf for them, and that will get them off my back. We oftentimes do things that, in the light of day, wouldn't make any sense at all when we're scared. But that's where Aaron is. And so they make the golden calf, and they're having a grand old time. The rioting turns into revelry, hooping and hollering and dancing around and all these things. And up on the mountaintop, God hears it and Moses hears it. And then things get really, really interesting. Did you hear how God is portrayed in this story? When God spoke to Moses years before out of the burning bush to tell him to go liberate the people, God said, I have heard the cries of my people under Pharaoh. I want you to bring my people out of slavery into freedom. But now, when God's people are down below, worshiping a golden calf, dancing all around, drinking, rioting, all doing all those wonderful things, did you hear how the pronoun changes? Your people, Moses, they're down below. Your people whom you brought out of Egypt. God is presented as passing the buck, if you will. It's now Moses' fault. Your people. It's not unlike, I mean, I, I have never had children of my own, but I've certainly heard parents talk about children. Your son. Your daughter. Your grandchildren. Not mine. It happens. 
Now, one could get into a great theological debate about this is the way the Israelites understand God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's, do, let's not go down that road. Can we say this is an evolutionary story, not about how God changes, but about how perhaps we human beings change our understanding of this eternal spirit? Can we read the Bible as an evolutionary understanding of people becoming more aware of, hmm, sometimes our human behavior, we can't always project it onto God. Just put that out there as a possibility. And then come down the mountain with Moses. He gets down to the bottom. He sees, he sees all of his hard work just going up in flames <laughs> as the people are worshiping this golden idol. I mean, he's just been up talking to the creator of heaven and earth. And the people, whether his or God's, <laughs> or Aaron's, are down below bowing down before a golden calf. It can raise all kinds of questions, my friends, about what are the gods, who are the gods we worship. My good friend and mentor, the Reverend Dr. Reuben Shears, used to talk about one of the reasons we come together on a Sunday morning, although he was out of the black church tradition, it was the entire Sunday day. <laughs> the reason we come together is to remember at least for an hour who really holds our lives and who's worth giving, who or what is worth giving our lives to. The other six days of the week, the world around us asks us, demands that we worship all these little mini-gods, mini-gods of our own egos, mini-gods of our success, mini-gods of our status, many gods of this car, that car, this grade, that grade. On Sunday, Reuben would say, we come to worship the one true God. So the sermon could stop there and asking, what are our golden calves in our own lives or in the life of our country, the life of this world? But for me, this story gets more interesting the deeper we go into it. After Moses comes down from the mountain, confronts his brother, says, what in heaven's name are you doing down here? And Aaron's response, God love him, is one of the most human responses in all the Bible. Did you hear that? These people... <laughs> These people, they wanted me to do something, and so I told them to take off all their jewelry and throw it into the fire, and out came this calf. It's not my fault, even though three verses ahead of time, Aaron has crafted that calf from all that molten gold. <laughs> out of the fire came that calf. Not my fault. Dog ate my homework. I think this, this story not only talks about what and who do we idolize, but also about do we trust the one true God? Do we trust God enough to be honest? To be honest, to be able to say, ah, you know what? I screwed up. I didn't allow enough time for this project. I was careless in my choice of words. I didn't do what I said I would do. And I apologize. I take responsibility. Not that you were offended, but that I hurt you. I apologize that my actions caused disruption. I apologize that I formed that calf. It didn't just jump out of the fire on its own. It's one of the hardest things in the world, I think, to do. And the notion of passing the buck goes all the way back to the very beginning. 
Go back to the, to the Genesis story, the creation of the first human beings, the first man and the first woman. After the whole thing with the apple and the snake and all of that, God comes to find them in the garden, the man and the woman, says to the man, what, on, what in God's name have you done? <laughs> what does the man say? That woman whom you gave to me, she seduced me. She beguiled me. And the woman no, it's going, oh my God, what am I going to say? The woman says, that snake whom you gave, whom you created, tricked me. And the snake doesn't have any shoulders to shrug anymore. So <laughs> snake, but that kind of, no, it's not really my fault. You know, it's not really my responsibility. Being honest is a spiritual discipline. And in 12-step programs, it is the primary spiritual discipline. As any of us who've been a part of 12-step programs know, the very first thing you do is to say, my name is and I am. And one of the basic principles is practice honesty in all our affairs. All our affairs. And it's not simply to... It's not by any means to heap on shame and guilt or sin or all those things. But I think what's going on for Aaron and perhaps goes on for us when we get caught in, oh no, you know, it's yada, 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 is fear once again. Fear that if we're honest with ourselves, with the other, with God, all bets are off. But my experience, and I think the experience we hear of the Hebrew people all the way through the Exodus, is that when they can be honest about who they really are, or what they've done, or when fear has gotten the best of them, that's when they can really be in a right relationship with this mystery called God. In the same way, we can be in right relationship in our families or churches or work. It takes a lot of energy to not tell the truth. It takes a lot of energy to continually try to figure out what can I say next to get me farther away from being honest with myself and with the other. Huckleberry Finn learned that in that wonderful book by Mark Twain, and he finally comes to the conclusion, you can't pray a lie. You can try. I've tried at times. But ultimately, ultimately, we can't. But the more we try, I think the further and further and further we get away from the possibility of grace possibility of healing, the possibility of change. Because all the energy is going into, oh, how can I make this, how can I do this differently? What can I make, what can I say to make this all go away? We see nations doing it. Our nation has done it a great deal. We still wrestle with that now. How do we tell our history? How do we tell our history with the current conflict in the Middle East? How can we be honest with ourselves, with the other, and most of all, honest with God? The writer Frederick Buechner says that To confess our lives, to tell the truth, essentially, is not to tell God anything God does not already know. But then until we confess that, that brokenness, that dishonesty, all of that is an abyss between us and God. But when we come clean, at least with ourselves and with God, our lives become 
the bridge. Our lives become the bridge. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, I'm right up there with Aaron. (laughs) This calf just came out. But like any other discipline, whatever practice we might have, the more we do it, the easier it becomes. There was a wonderful book written about a girls' basketball team in Massachusetts a number of years ago ago called Hope is a Muscle, and that the way the team really prepared wasn't only physically in terms of jump shots and free throws and all of that, but also believing, believing that they could actually win the championship. They didn't, but they came that close. (laughs) And the title of the book was Hope is a Muscle. And I think honesty is too. Because the more that we, in the words of the 12-step programs, practice honesty in all our affairs, the stronger we can be. And the more we can move ahead, the more healing we can find. If Aaron had only come clean with his brother, saying, you know, Moses, I felt abandoned. I don't have the relationship with God that you have. I'm not up there on the mountain watching God write out the Ten Commandments or having the direct hotline to heaven through the burning bush or all those kinds of things. I was scared. I was alone. I don't have your faith. I don't have that connection. But if by some chance he had said, I threw the gold in the fire and then I fashioned that calf and that was one of the dumbest things I've ever done, my hunch is that he might have experienced some kind of grace and healing in that moment. When we turn from the ways of death and turn to God's ways of life, God will be there. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish, Christian, Muslim. When we turn from the ways of death, and blaming the other and are honest to God and with God, God will be there. Honest to God. May the healing begin. Amen.